and by previous speakers about language justice or linguistic justice are equally relevant, highly relevant in fact, to, what, to the topic I'd like to discuss. I'm discussing a very specific language minority, um, unique in many ways because this is the language minority of the deaf and hard of hearing, particularly the, the profoundly deaf, those who use sign language as their, as their main language. And I'm going to try to talk of it, about it in the context of language policy and human rights. In other words, to tie it in with the whole theme of linguistic justice. We have been hearing uh, simultaneous interpreting here, which is a spoken medium usually, but of course simultaneous interpreting can also be done uh, into the signed modality, in which case it would be the same setting, a conference setting with a signed modality, but it can also be done remotely. Nowadays, much of the sign language interpreting is in fact done through uh, some kind of remote device, just as spoken language interpreting is also done remotely. I'd like to talk of it, as I said, in the context of language policy and this um, uh, picture, which is familiar to many of you who deal with language policy, uh, focuses on the fact that much of language policy is covert. In other words, much of what happens in terms of language policy is implicit or not immediately obvious, whereas the explicit and overt aspects of language policy uh, tend to be the smaller part of the whole theme. And when it comes to the deaf and to sign language, this is particularly true. And I'm going to focus on the discrepancy, on the marked discrepancy between overt policies and what actually happens, or what we would call in Hebrew, ben ha ratzui la matzui, between what we would like to see happen and what actually exists. So, I'll start out with a few obvious instruments or documents pertaining to the overt declarations of language policy, and even if they're not legally binding, they are widely viewed as the canon of what ought to be. So, of course, the International, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, December 1948, um, tells us a great deal about different aspects of human rights, which include the fact that one not, must not be discriminated against on grounds of language. And this, uh, as you see, applies to all rights and freedoms. It applies to the right to a fair and public hearing. It applies to the right to take part in government and to have access to public services, to medical care, and so on. Now, Ilana spoke about, and she used the phrase, people need to have rights to function in equal ways. And she focused on the fact that one of those rights is language rights, the right to understand, to participate, to be able to express oneself, and thence also to act. Well, this is, of course, equally true of those who use a signed language, and this is what I'd like to focus upon now. So, again, other instruments of international law uh, signed by many, many countries tell us about the, these different rights, and this is all part of overt language policy. <coughs> Moving on to sign languages, or signed languages as they are often called, uh, these data are not entirely up to date, they're from 2008, but I don't think there have been great dramatic changes since then. 44 countries have formally and legally moved to award their national sign language some form of official status. This is true in Israel too, it is a recognized language, it's not an official language, but it's a recognized language. But symbolic recognition, in other words, this overt statement, is not a guarantee for the effective improvement of the life of sign language users. And this is really the theme of my talk. Eleven countries don't provide any form of access for deaf people to education, health care, and employment. And only 18 countries, this is based on a study done by the World Federation of the Deaf, uh, only 18 countries recognize the signed language, language and fulfill all the requirements, the requirements for full recognition, which would be having an arrangement for recruiting trained interpreters, having ad adequate training and certification of interpreters, having a code of conduct and ethics, ethics, and paying for interpreting. Here I'm just focusing on interpreting. Of course, there's a lot more to language rights than just the right to an interpreter, but this is one aspect which is covered by only 18 countries out of well over 100. Um, in Israel, we're halfway there. We have the arrangements. The state does pay up to a certain point. There is a code of conduct. Training and certification, well, we're getting there. So 
we're somewhere in the middle of the scale, not too bad. Um, I will skip these statistics because I think our timing has run a little bit short, but basically the idea is that most countries are still somewhere on the way towards recognizing that deaf speakers of a signed, local signed language are entitled to certain rights of which they are often deprived and that these rights cannot in fact be assured just by paying lip service or passing another law or stating another declaration. Rather, certain measures have to be put in place in order for the deaf child to be able to function in society as well as a hearing child, which would mean that the deaf child must be given from the very beginning access to his or to, to a signed language. A deaf child, a child who really cannot hear, who is profoundly deaf, and I'm leaving aside the whole very controversial issue of the cochlear implant, which is uh, a very, very, as I said, controversial matter. Putting that aside, basically a deaf child, most 90% of deaf children are born to hearing parents, and 90% of deaf couples give birth to hearing children. So that even the concept of a mother tongue for a deaf child is not as simple as it would be for most of us, when you think about it, and mother tongue is usually a tongue spoken by your mother. But a deaf child cannot hear and therefore cannot speak the mother's language, and the mother, who, unless she has learned to sign, which is unusual, cannot speak the language that the child would normally and naturally use. And what normally tends to happen, unfortunately, is that the child is made to accommodate to the hearing world by reading lips, etc., which is never a full solution. And therefore, surprise, surprise, deaf children tend to fall behind quite drastically in their overall intellectual and cognitive development. They are also generally by the system uh, pushed in the direction of preferring orality over signing. This is, of course, a very controversial matter, but it goes without saying that unless you provide the deaf child with both the signed language and the oral language, access to the oral language, you are depriving him or her of the option of becoming as competent in society as, the, as his or her hearing counterpart. Uh, in various surveys that have been done, which I won't go into, this is one in Africa, and the next one will be about the Middle East, you will see that countries vary widely in their efforts to accommodate deaf, the deaf population. So that at the very top we have access to sign language interpreting at university, which is provided by only three of the countries. South Africa stands out because South Africa generally is very high on providing interpreting into its 11 official languages. Um, and we have a few other, but then there are countries where almost none of these privileges, so-called privileges, of course they're not privileges, they are rights, uh, are provided so that the prospect of a deaf university-aged person of acquiring a university education are much higher in South Africa or Uganda than in Mozambique or Zimbabwe. So, so the survey uh, shows. By the same token, in the Middle East, for some reason the study did not include Israel. Um, in any case, uh, in Israel, access to a sign language interpreter at the university is provided to a point, but of course that hinges on the availability of highly competent sign language interpreters and of having the same interpreter going with the same student to the same course consistently rather than having a constant turnover of interpreters and many other so-called technical conditions without which the quality of the interpreter interpreting may be compromised and therefore access to higher education ultimately may be compromised from the perspective of the deaf user. Are deaf people a disabled minority or a language minority? This is another very controversial issue, which again I won't go into, and there's massive literature about it. Either way, obviously their rights need to be respected, but from some perspectives they are viewed as a disabled minority, in which case they fall under the legislation that applies to the disabled, which speaks about the um, fact that the state must take measures to ensure equal access. Equal access for a deaf person would be language. Language would be let them learn their language from the very beginning, sign language. Let them have access to the spoken language from the very beginning, which would be a lot of remedial teaching, etc. And let them have interpreting services from early childhood all the way through. This would be, in fact, 
providing access. Whether this actually happens or not is a, is a moot question. And if we look at yet another document, um, children belonging to such a minority, and here they're talking about any language minority, <coughs> which should include, in fact, the non-hearing, the deaf minority, um, or who is indigenous, uh, this would apply, for example, to the discussion earlier of Arab children in Israel, shall not be denied the right in the community with other members of his or her group to enjoy his or her own culture, to profess and practice his or her own religion, or to use his or her own language. Again, this ought to apply to deaf children, by the same token. And another important implication of this is it's not just a matter of your being entitled to your language, it's a matter of being able to take pride in your language, to know that it is recognized, that it is seen as a language. By the way, in Israel you cannot do a Bagrut exam in, sign, in Israeli sign language. In other words, it isn't yet, and there have been arguments about this and there have been protests about it, it isn't, according to the Ministry of Education, it's not a language. Now, if you stand in a crowd of deaf people, and I have often done this, I don't sign myself, but I, I've had this opportunity, it is as much a language as any other language that goes without saying, and full communication is possible. So the fact that one cannot do a matriculation in lang in a exam in that language is a sign that the ministry, the powers that be, does not recognize it as a full-fledged language, and that, of course, is problematic in itself. And she'll have free assistance of an interpreter. Again, that's a means of providing access. Others see deaf communities as a language minority rather than as a disabled group. Many of the deaf people themselves prefer to see themselves as a, as a minority, a language minority. In other words, we are the same as everyone else, except we cannot speak the language because we cannot hear in a sense like an immigrant minority that hasn't yet learned the language, only in their case they, never, they will never learn to hear and therefore they will always need some form of access. Um, so basically what is often demanded and what is reflected in this report on the promotion of sign languages, quite recent as you see, is uh, recognition of sign language. Bilingual education, which means that children from age zero up should be exposed to the signed language, the local signed language, as well as the spoken language, interpreting service, and awareness and knowledge about the situation of deaf people by the community. This is basically what is demanded if language rights and human rights, ipso facto human rights, are to be recognized. Uh, this is one of the ways that the uh, World Federation for the Deaf has of representing these four demands. Interpretation, accessibility, education, and acknowledgement of the sign language. Um, a, a little bit about the politics of it. I brought just one slide from China and one from Israel. A very, very big country. According to the latest report, there are 20 million, 20 million deaf or hard of hearing people in China. But there are 33 interpreters. So, now of course, of the 20 million there, are, not everyone is a signer. Many of them are people who have lost their hearing and, and cannot and do not necessarily sign, or there are people who are hard of hearing. But you can imagine that quite a few million young people or older people need sign language interpreters. So one of the uh, people who studied the situation mm -hmm, uh, says that the biggest incentive must come through political channels. In other words, you, the deaf, must organize, or people who sympathize or wish to help the deaf, deaf or some advocacy group, must organize politically. And it's true everywhere. Unless you have political pressure, things don't move. And that's in line with Ilana's talk as well. And I must give this, this is a wonderful example. 1880, there was the famous um, International Congress of Educators for the Deaf in Milan, where it was decided that children must not use sign language, tie their hands behind their back if they dare to sign with one another at the School for the Deaf and elsewhere, ban sign language, prevent deaf citizens from participation, prevent the opportunity to demonstrate their uh, abilities. It was a brutal rule which prevailed for over a hundred years and was the ruling norm or ethos of the Association of Educators of the Deaf. Only in 2010, 130 years later, the organizing committee opened the Congress in Vancouver with the long-awaited sweeping repudiation. So things do change 130 years later. Sweeping repudiation. We reject all the resolutions passed at the Milan Congress, 
that denied the inclusion of sign languages. We regret the detrimental effects. Tell that to the 90-year-old person who was in school, you know, somewhere along the lines. And we call on all nations of the world to remember history and ensure that educational programs accept and respect all languages and all forms of communication. So sometimes humans do come to see the light, only it sometimes takes 130 years for that to happen, which is most regrettable, but I suppose there's hope. Um, I did want to say more about interpreting. Interpreting is my field. I'm not specifically a sign language expert. I'm a big believer in community interpreting, interpreting for language minorities. And since the deaf are a language minority that is rarely mentioned in that context, I decided to focus on deaf users of sign language. Interpreters are the key. And the thing about interpreters is that unless you have good interpreters, deaf people do not really have de facto access to anything. And there aren't enough qualified interpreters. Here at bar -Ilan University, we set up the first, the first academic program for the training of qualified sign language inter Israeli sign language interpreters, and we're very proud of it. But this is a very slow step and a slow process. Let us hope that it continues to grow. Uh, and we are moving towards professionalization, so that once in the, in the past, all interpreters for deaf people were children of deaf adults, what's known as CODA, children of deaf adults. A deaf couple had a hearing child. That child, whether he or she, usually she, wanted to or not, became the parent's interpreter. And as they grew up, if they felt that they could do it, they kept on doing it, perhaps, for others. Now we are moving towards a professionalization, which also means instead of, come along, mom and dad, and I'll speak for you, you sit over there in the corner and I'll deal with these clerks, it's a more professional attitude of the role of the interpreter is, as well. But very often the protest, on, and I, I, I have two minutes, <laughs> very often the response of the powers that be is, yes, you're right, they are entitled to interpreters. Yes, you're right, the interpreters should be trained and should be paid, but it costs so much. It costs so much. Now I should say, in all fairness, um, the deaf population is the only population for which the state officially has a system of interpreting. Every deaf individual is entitled to 45 hours a year, which may sound like a lot, but when you think about it, 45 hours a year, if you divide it by the number of days in a year, ain't much. But it means that 45 hours, if you need to go to the doctor, or if you need to appear in court, if you need to meet with your child's teacher or whatever, 45 hours a year. And in the case of the deaf blind, it's 61 hours a, a year. There's a whole scale, and it's all complicated. But anyway, there is an entitlement on behalf of the state, but the claim of policymakers tends to be that it's costly. And if it's costly, we can't afford it. Um, and as Graham Turner, a well-known sign language expert, tells us, policymakers have a tendency not to notice if la lives are damaged so long as the job gets done cheaply. And another point which I will almost end with, According to the European Union of the Deaf, it costs a lot more to exclude deaf people. And this is what I say also about other language minorities. Excluding them is ultimately costlier than including them in terms of social welfare benefits. There is a tremendous unemployment rate among deaf people. They aren't born to be unemployed. They're born to be able to communicate. And if they don't have that option, obviously their employment opportunities are drastically curtailed. So if deaf people were guaranteed the right to use sign language in all spheres of life, they might become more productive and people who could contribute back to society by paying taxes and having purchasing power. So obviously the argument of costs is a double-edged sword. So to sum up, deaf children, and later on as they grow up, need to have access to a first natural language. All of us had access to our first natural language, and that's what deaf children need as well, and this would be their sign language. Uh, and they need to have access to literacy, which means learning the other language, the majority language in which uh, written communication takes place. And they need to have access to public services, education, etc., through professional interpreters paid for by the state. So to get back to this slide, there is and there remains a very big discrepancy between these very nice statements these uh, instruments, these universal declarations, these laws, etc., which are the overt policy, and the facts on the ground, which, is, which are manifestations of the covert policy. 
And Ilana's aim and my aim and the aim of many of the speakers at this conference, I think, is to reduce the discrepancy between the overt and the covert by raising awareness and making all of us a little bit more activist or at least a little bit more willing to stand up for the rights of language minorities and thereby, as I said, reducing the disparity. Just as this happened, right? <laughs> Suffrage for women was a big battle and lo and behold, women now vote on equal terms with men. Okay, just as this came to pass, and just as we saw with the Milan Declaration that things changed, so too, in our case, changes can take place. Thank you very much. The difference between the natural language, which would be the sign language for the kids, right? And then you said they have to have access to the literacy within the country, but that's the same language. Sign languages are... There's English, French, German, and Japanese within sign language, right? By the two. Okay. By the two. Um, I'm glad you asked that. I forgot, I did not, I hardly said anything about sign languages as such from the linguistic standpoint. Israeli sign language is in, in no sense a signed form of Hebrew. There is such a thing as signed Hebrew, which deaf people hate, which is basically taking Hebrew words and having a sign for each word using the syntax of Hebrew, which creates a kind of code switching of the worst natural kind. It's, it's functional, it's instrumental, but it's not a language. It's not a language that anyone actually speaks as a language. So that learning Israeli sign language is learning one language. Learning Hebrew is learning another language. This is bilingualism. The same with ASL, American Sign Language. And, for example, American Sign Language and British Sign Language are totally different. See, that's what I'm saying. So it is a natural language. They're all natural languages, but they're not related. The spoken language and the signed language are two different languages. Okay. So what I was saying is the child should be entitled, first of all, to learn the signed language, and as soon as it becomes appropriate, to learn the spoken language okay. for literacy. <coughs> Universals in sign language, this is a big psycholinguistic topic. Yes, there are, just as there are cognitive universals in language in general, and they're probably more or less the same. There are some interesting studies of that. And I, at first I thought you were asking whether there's a university, so I should mention there's also a university, one university in the, in the world, Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C., where the whole university is in American Sign Language. And the, the non-deaf uh, staff is a very, very small minority. Hmm? Who attends? Uh, mostly deaf people, but also people, excuse me, Americans, no, I know quite a few Israelis who have gone to that university. They had to acquire American Sign Language uh, as a separate language. That was exactly in relation to the last point you made. I was wondering, uh, uh, are there estimates of the degree, uh, ways of measuring the relative degree of difficulty when you speak one sign language, i.e. ASL, for example, to learn well, you know, French sign language, German sign language, and so on and so forth. How difficult is it, and is the difficulty, the level of difficulty, is it more or less symmetrical or not? Interesting question. For the record, I don't pretend to be a linguist in general, a psycholinguist specifically, and certainly not an expert on signed languages, but from my general knowledge, uh, signed languages, although they are not, um, let me put it differently, signed languages are more iconic than spoken languages. And therefore there are some, there are more shared signs between signed languages than there are shared words between two spoken languages, particularly if they're not cognate, like Spanish or Italian or something. So I would venture to think, and I've seen this happen with deaf people, I had a friend from Vienna who signs come visit an Israeli couple, and within 10 minutes they were communicating in sign language. There is something called gestuno, which is kind of the Esperanto of signed languages, but, um, you know, they use it as, you know, faute de mieux, uh, but basically the, the, the short answer to your question is, yes, it's probably easier to go from ASL to BSL to ISL than from English to Hebrew, but I'm saying this without any empirical evidence.